Okay, back. So when you get down here, you'll notice that it's a growth period to 7.79 with our boy Charlemagne um, effectively coming to power in um, 7.68. All right, but officially 771 or so so you got salute sonte salute sonte five syllables uranon is three so just before uranon it's official okay but three syllables prior ton mes na all right so you can say during do or doing na, he um, takes over, his dad dies. But there's a sort of three year hiatus, maybe because of issues with Carl Amon or whatever, although their relationships were pretty good. Just the same, that's then, and then it's not until here, between the, the me and the ta, of verse 27 that you know the Pope whoever's the Pope then plays that gambit to crown him on Christmas Day in either 808 or 1. Charlemagne doesn't live too much longer after that okay you got ta duna meus kai doxis polis so he lives another so that's another nine years okay Ten years, I guess, because this is seven eighty and thirty is eight ten, <clears throat> and then he dies. This is really interesting. He dies in eight fourteen, okay, and this is exact. This is so funny. Acromenon, four syllables, and what does it mean? Well, in the context, it means starting, but it has this connotation. Archon means ruler. So it's like the thing that rules the time. Okay, and right where the cursor is at the end of Archimedes is when Charlemagne dies. So what when the Bible stops a person's life, okay, at the end of a word, it's kind of a, a what do you want to call it? Compliment. Like with Constantine, he dies at, in the middle of Pro el picotas in um, Ephesians 1.12. Okay. Pro el picotas means first fruits, and the irony there, it's syllable 337 in Paul in Ephesians 1.12. The irony there, you know, prophetic irony, is that Constantine supposedly dies on Pentecost. Well, that's what the holiday was called in Hebrew. I mean, translated to Greek. Pro el picotas, first fruits. Okay, that was the beginning, the first day of the countdown to Pentecost. And by cutting Constantine off in the middle of pro el picotas, it means he didn't make it. I mean, that he saved or not, I, I have no idea. But if he saved, he didn't mature. It's a snub of his whole reign because his reign stops. His death terminates in the middle of a word. Okay. Now sometimes the Bible will terminate at a, at a prefix. That's that can be a compliment depending on what the prefix is. Like arco means ruler. Archon is the word for ruler. Okay. So here this idea of ruling, which in context is is talking about the beginning of or starting of. Okay. But even so, it's the head. It starts. It rules. It governs. Okay? So that's a kind of compliment to, to Charlemagne. All right? It's not saying that he was mature, and it's not even saying that he was saved. It's saying that his rule was good. Okay? To end his life right there at that sentence. And it's saying something good about the polity, and it's saying something good about the people. That they were, they were positive doesn't mean that they got their doctrine right. It meant that they were, they were learning Bible. Because this whole thing is about tracing the word 
and its interest in its progressively westward movement in the timeline of Matthew and therefore also in Luke. Okay? And so then this is all about, you know, um, the expectation of seeing him. Okay? His appearance. And the worship of his appearance. So it, it's kind of metaphorical for, for trying to tell you that interest in God is growing, all right? And it's growing primarily at this time, the poster boy of it anyway, is in what we call France. Now by the time you get here to the end, we're not talking about Charlemagne anymore, he died here, we're talking about, you know, Louis the Pious, who was pretty apostate actually, who ends up becoming the successor Holy Roman Emperor, and all the territory that they started to gain, that they had gained under Charlemagne, starts to kind of fall apart. That's why this Kephalos is kind of satirical. Okay, it starts to sort of fall apart. And to see him coming, to actually see him revealed well, yeah, no, because by this time, by 850, everybody sort of, they, they see it's 820 plus 30, everybody's starting to get, just get antsy again, okay? And after Pius, the, Louis the Pius, I think you have Charles the Bold or Charles the Bald, and that wasn't so good. Okay. So, the thing to know once you get to 850 here, is that the Lord had reserved the parable of the fig tree for syllable 1036 in Matthew. But our boy is only up to 8, you know, at the end of the verse, it's 840 equals 870 AD. And this is the timeline for church. And it's saying, you know, Observe the parable of the fig tree, and this is how you know it's talking about church, in all the trees, not just Israel. But this has Israel mentioned in it because you got the word suk in there. Alright? So, telling you the parable about Israel means that Israel comes back into focus during this time even in the West. So that's 850, 860, because you this is elision. It's really a crassus. Um so this is eight fifty here. This is eight fifty one, eight fifty two, fifty three, fifty four, fifty five, fifty six, fifty seven, fifty eight. Okay. Fifty nine, sixty, sixty one, sixty two. So 862 is the beginning of the word suke, meaning fig tree, meaning Israel. So what was it about Israel in 862? She was overrun by the Muslims. Yeah, and they were starting to break up too. See, that's one thing about the Arabs. If they're not fighting against the Jews, they're fighting with each other. They just fight. Ishmael will be a wild ass of a man. Well, that's true for all of Abraham's other kids. You could argue it's true for all Abraham's kids. Jews are fractious. It's because they're so smart. It's because they're so free. And even in, in shul, if you went to shul as a Jewish kid, that's one of the first things you learn to do is to argue. And when you're in yeshiva as a you know semi-adult, one of your jobs, if you're studying at yeshiva, is you find a study buddy, you know, which was made famous in the movie Yentl. You find a study buddy and you argue Torah to each other. You argue it. Well, if this principle is this, what about this principle is that? And if you actually read the Talmud yourself, you find Rabbi Blah Blah says yes, Rabbi Blah Blah says no, Rabbi Yidiyah says maybe. See, you got two Jews, you got three opinions. Well, the same thing is true with the Arabs. Okay? It's because they're so smart. 
They can think circles around each other and all they want to do is argue all day long. And the Arabs in particular, all they want to do is take what you got. There's an old proverb about an Arab comes and he steals all your forks. And then he negotiates with you the price to return nine out of ten of your forks. Okay? So, fig tree, Israel, Palestine, that was the name given by the Romans, Palestine is in something of a turmoil at this point, which is good, because just as this kingdom, even though it's starting to fall apart a little bit, just as this kingdom finally gets established and unified and it's friendly to the Jews, not as friendly by the time Charlemagne died because he goes a little anti-Semitic at the end, but, you know, not everybody all over the kingdom is paying attention to that. Okay? It's a little more friendly. So you have a massive influx of Jews during this time because it was advertised as friendly. Charlemagne was telling Jews everywhere he could find them, come on over here, we're going to be friendly to you. Yeah, because he wanted copies of the Old Testament and he wanted Jewish skills and all the rest of it because they're smart. And the Jews came. And they came to Spain. And then the Muslims came to Spain and tried to kill the Jews. And so the Jews moved north up into France. You see the point? So when Israel breaks up, where are the Jews going to go? Because they're not supposed to be there, but they are there. So now where are they going to go? Okay, well, God prepared France first. Okay, there's a lot of anti-Semitism that comes in later in France as a result of this. Wherever the Jews go, once they get someplace parked and they're nice and comfortable, then the people around them who are not Jews start getting anti-Semitic. It's ridiculous. It's a trend of history. Of course, it's in Leviticus 26 and Deuteronomy 28, and the same applies to Christians. Okay, so but that's why the word fig tree is here. And then it says, and all the trees. See, tree is a metaphor in the Bible for nation, polity. And all the trees. Well, at this point, there are a bunch of trees. There used to only be the Holy Roman Empire, and then everybody else was a province or a titular, you know, government of some kind, but really ruled from Rome. Okay, but that's not true now. you got lots of trees in Europe. And okay, maybe the territories are the size of, you know, New Jersey or Delaware. Okay, but that's a place you can be free, relatively speaking, for this time. And that's what's happening here. Now, under Louis the Pious, it wasn't quite so nice because he was so pious. He was apostate. <clears throat> Whenever people pride themselves on their piety, you know that they're apostate. But it, he didn't stay in power during all this time. I forget who came after him. I think it was Charles the Bald. And Charles was something of a, you know, nice guy. I mean, really weak, but enough. Well, because of all that happening, too, all the territories that got united under Charlemagne, under the head, okay. Of course, he dies here, but right at this point, he's still, his empire's intact. But they kind of like, you know, the Saxons and the Angles and the Jutes, they were over in Britain and they didn't call themselves Britain, that was the Roman name for the territory. They start to want to rule themselves. And, you know, Louis Pius, he would rather be pious than hold on to the territory, so he kind of lets them get away with it. And Charles the Bald isn't particularly better. So by the time you get here, we got lots of trees. And yeah, okay, you can call yourself Holy Roman Emperor and we'll bow. Maybe even pay you a little money, but otherwise we're just going to ignore you. And that's exactly what happened. So by 870, we got a 91 here. And here's the point. We want all the trees. You know, we got 24,000 Bible manuscripts. No one of them is perfect, but there's at least one of them for every verse that's got it perfect. Okay, or we can know what the right words are. Got to have lots of trees for that. Got to have lots of nations. Got to have freedom to move and vote with your feet so that you can have and be in a place where you are free to study the Bible. 
without someone trying to tell you what to believe. And that's why God calls this a 91 by the end of 870 AD. We got all the trees. See, learn the parable from the fig tree. What was the fig tree? Israel. What was her job? To be a light unto the nations. Okay, but the fig tree is down now. It's taken over by the abominating Muslims. But then we need other trees. Yeah. And God spent time getting all these other trees together out from under the crumbling Roman Empire because the Roman Empire stopped being a good tree. It got rotten at the, at the root, and so then it just started to collapse. In the West, the movement of Bible interest goes west. And so God sets up the nations in advance. So by the time the fig tree again is ripe for falling apart, now the Jews can get out from where they were trapped under the Muslims and start moving west. With, of course, in its place, preceding the demise of the Umayyads, who were defeated back up here by Charles Martel. Where was it? Right here. Right here at Talasas, right in the middle of it. See? They were defeated. The Arabs are in the middle of the sea, drowning like Pharaoh. Got that? Cute, huh? Okay, so now the tree is freed up because after they were drowned by Pharaoh, that didn't mean they were ex exiled from Spain right away. You had to wait a while. Okay, but by the time you get down to Sukane right here, the Arabs are largely either disinterested in having anything to do with control and politics, or they're so weak that they're just not paying attention. And now the Jews can move in to France. Now, a thousand years later, or even 500 years later, that's going to be a problem. But right now, it's a good thing. They're moving up from Lombardy because the Lombards weren't particularly nice. And neither were the, you know, the the more apostate Catholics who surrounded the Pope, okay? And, you know, going too, too far to the east wasn't going to be too good because then you had all those other pagan peoples that were around. And, you know, they wouldn't need to go farther north because France was as far north as you could go unless you moved east. You see the point? It was just prepared for them to exit. All the trees. See, and all the trees. By 17. What's the message here? God's will got done the way he wanted it done. Okay? And God prepared a way to, to flee. God prepared a way to get out. And of course, that's what this text has all been talking about. How do you get out? Get out. Get out. Therefore, learn from the fig tree. And then, you know, it's like when you see that it's you know, getting, you, you know, it's starting to leave, L-E-A-V-E, -E, then you know that near is the exit, summer in this particular case, summer is a time of war, all right? So this exiting, this exodus keeps on going through 900, and I'll pick that up at the next increment.